We also caused the lowering of the central bank rate, the CBR, to 7.25% from 8.25%, so as to prompt commercial banks to lower interest rates applicable to their borrowers and thereby avail much affordable, much needed affordable credit to MSMEs across our country. We lowered the cash reserve ratio, the CRR, to 4.25% from 5.25%, so as to provide additional li liquidity of approximately 35 billion to commercial banks in order to directly support borrowers that were distressed as a result of the economic effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Central Bank of Kenya also provided flexibility to banks with regard to the requirement the requirements applicable to loan classification and provision of loans that were performing as of the 2nd of March, 2020. We further engaged banks and all financial institutions to support all enterprises and families that sought to restructure their commercial banking through debt moratoriums and review of tenure of these facilities. There was a temporary suspension of the listing of the credit reference bureaus of any person, micro, small, and medium enterprise, and corporate entities whose loans had fallen overdue or was in arrears. The Kenya Revenue Authority was directed to expedite the payments of all verified VAT refund claims, amounting to some 10 billion shillings, or an alternative, allow for the offsetting of withholding VAT in order to improve cash flows for businesses. The 6 billion shillings from the Universal Health Coverage Kitty was immediately appropriated strictly towards supporting counties in the recruitment of additional health workers to support in the management of the spread of COVID-19. Subsequently, we rolled out the second stimulus package with the support of this house, whose tenure tenant was an eight-point economic stimulus program amounting to some Kenya shillings, 56.6 billion. The first element of the eight-point program focused on Buy Kenya, Build Kenya policy. On local infrastructure development, we allocated 10 billion towards the National Hygiene Program, dubbed Kazi Mtaani Initiative. The program was conceptualized as an extended public works project aimed at utilizing labor intensive approaches to create sustainable public good in the urban development sector. The program has so far secured gainful engagement to over 750 youths engaged in the improvements to the environment and hygiene and in the rehabilitation of access roads footbridges, and other public infrastructure through local labor. The second was on education, with an additional 6.5 billion to the Ministry of Education to hire an additional 10,000 teachers and 1,000 ICT interns to support digital learning and the acquisition of 250,000 locally fabricated desks. The third element of the program targeted small and medium enterprises through an injection of Kenya shillings 5 billion as seed capital for the SME credit guarantee scheme. The intention here was to provide affordable credit to small and micro enterprises. The fourth focused on universal health coverage through acquisition of locally made beds. The fifth element of the stimulus program focused on agriculture. We prioritize 3 billion for the supply of farm inputs through e-vouchers, targeting 200,000 small-scale farmers, and a further 1.5 billion to assist flower and horticultural producers to access international markets in a period where we had a shortage of flights into and out of our country. Tourism was the sixth area of target for the stimulus program. To jumpstart this important sector and to protect its players from heavy financial losses, 
We provided soft loans to hotels and related establishments through the Tourism Finance Corporation, and a total of $2 billion was applied towards renovation of facilities and the restructuring of business operations by to mitigate the impact of deforestation and climate change and to enhance the provision of water, water facilities. We rehabilitated wells, water pans, and underground tanks in arid and semi-arid areas, and we applied Kenya Shilling's 2.5 billion for flood control measures and our Greening Kenya campaign. The eighth and final element was a stimulus program was manufacturing, a strategy we enforce as a strategy, we enforced the policy on Buy Kenya, Build Kenya, and we set aside an initial investment of 600 million shillings to purchase locally manufactured vehicles. This was expected to sustain the operations of local motor vehicle manufacturers and their attendant employment of workers. Mr. Speakers, the foregoing interventions help to reinforce the resilience of our economy while cushioning millions of households against the effect on the, of the economy. And in that regard, while most economies in the world shrunk, Kenya's economy grew at 0.3 during the 2020 period, despite the COVID challenge. Although this positive growth was minimal, the second quarter of 2021 registered the most impressive growth ever recorded in our nation's real GDP. During the second quarter of 2021, real GDP recorded a phenomenal 10.1% growth, and this is the highest growth ever recorded in one quarter in Kenya's history. It is also the first time Kenya has hit a double-digit growth number. The last time Kenya's economy got close to this kind of performance was in 2010, during the Grand Coalition government, when the economy hit an 8.4% growth rate. And it was this impressive trajectory that led me to announce a 13-point interventions unveiled on Masujaa Day this year to cushion the economy with a further Kenya shillings 25 billion as our third stimulus package, pushing the aggregate of our stimuli over the COVID period to Kenya shillings 257 billion. The third stimulus package focused on the key productive and service sectors that covered agriculture, health, education, drought response, policy infrastructure, financial inclusion, energy, and environmental conservation. These 13 interventions were as follows. The first intervention was in the T subsector, where I am pleased to confirm that we have supported the T subsector with Kenya shillings 1 billion in support of fertilizer subsidy for our tea farmers, securing our nation's top agricultural export, and happy also to report that our tea farmers are today receiving the highest pay that they have received in many, many years. The second intervention was in the sugar subsector, and I note with satisfaction that smoke is once again billowing in our public sugar mills following the allocation of Kenya shillings 1.5 billion in aid of the sugar sector that is being applied towards factory maintenance and the payment of farmers arrears. The third intervention was in the coffee subsector and I confirm that 1 billion shillings was released in support of the ongoing reforms in the subsector that is being applied towards completion of the ongoing targeted interventions in the coffee subsector. The fourth intervention was in the livestock subsector. The Kenya Shillings 1.5 billion national livestock offtake program is on course in support of communities adversely affected by the ongoing drought in Asal counties. The fifth intervention was also in the livestock subsector and I confirm that the interventions geared towards the reduction of the cost of animal feeds are well on course. The sixth intervention was in education. 
noting the success of my administration's policy on 100% transition from primary to secondary school, I did direct that the National Treasury should allocate a further 8 billion shillings to the Ministry of Education for the CBC Infrastructure Expansion Program, targeting the construction of 10,000 classrooms. And I am most pleased to confirm to the nation that all the count, count, county's works and constructions of the classrooms should commence by early December 2021. The seventh intervention was in health to in an additional 50 new level three hospitals to be situated in both non-covered areas as well as densely populated areas across our nation. And I also directed the National Treasury to allocate the sum of 3.2 billion for the immediate construction of these new medical facilities. The eighth intervention was a national sanitation program. We started this program, as I said earlier, to harness the energy of our young people and to give them a buffer against COVID-related unemployment. Noting the success of Kazi Mutaani program and its effect in enhancing opportunities for the youth across our country, we did require the National Treasury to allocate a further 10 billion shillings for the third phase of the Kazi Mtaani program to cover youths and to be rolled out in all our counties across the country. The ninth intervention was on energy and petroleum. Being fully aware of the positive strides being made in our economic recovery and cognizant that the gains stand the risk of being eroded by high energy energy prices, I am pleased to confirm that we are on course to institutionalize the sought reforms. The tenth intervention was on access to credit. Critically, I asked the National Treasury and the Central Bank of Kenya to consider suspending the blacklisting of creditors with loans below Kenya shillings 5 million at the Credit Reference Bureau in a move that targeted retaining the bounce back potential of the foundation of our economy. As the 11th intent, I also asked the National Treasury and the Central Bank of Kenya to consider revising the maximum amount an individual or enterprise can withdraw or deposit from a bank that previously stood at 1 million shillings, which was not supportive of our current business environment. I'm glad to report to Parliament that as of the 8th November 2021, the Central Bank of Kenya issued a notice suspending the listing of negative credit information for borrowers with loans below Kenya shillings 5 million, and that fell into arrears from October 1st, 2021 to September 30th, 2022. This will give the MSMEs 12 months to reorganize themselves and to adapt to the new economic normal. I am also happy to report that the Central Bank of Kenya is at an advanced stage of revising the 1 million threshold for cash deposits and withdrawals in the banks. This will facilitate easy transactions for MSMEs and help the economy respond to COVID shocks. The 12th intervention was a digital financial services subsector. In recognition of the importance of the digital financial services, especially in the small scale traders and households at large, I did direct the National Treasury to engage all digital payment providers with the aim of deepening and expanding the use of payment channels. The third intervention was a two-pronged, was two-pronged, one in the area of vaccination against COVID-19 as part of our national response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We rolled out a national vaccine deployment plan aiming at vaccinating 10 million adults by June of 2022 and approximately 16 million by June of 2023. With regard to the COVID-19 vaccine production, 
we have set out to implement the lessons of self-reliance, which was once, which was one of the key learning points of the pandemic. As the first step towards this goal, we established the Kenya Biovax Limited, a venture that would locally produce anti-COVID-19 vaccines. I therefore directed the Ministry of Health to operationalize the company to form and fill an, an eventual manufacture of our locally produced vaccines by Easter of next year. Honorable members, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I would like to take special note of the resilience of our revenue collection systems under the Kenya Revenue Authority. For the first time, KRA has exceeded its revenue collection target, target despite the COVID stress over the economy. The KRA projected a Kenya shillings 1.5 trillion collection in tax during 2020. They collected Kenya shillings 1.67 trillion, which was in excess of their projected intention. But on this note, I must report on the sterling performance of KRA, not only under the COVID duress, but in the last eight years of our administration. In the last eight, eight years, KRA has collected Kenya shillings 10.8 trillion cumulatively in revenues. This means that in just eight years, KRA has collected the equivalent of Kenya's total GDP. It also means that on average, KRA collected 1.3 trillion shillings every year. Honorable speakers, honorable members, to accelerate the turnaround of our micro, small, and medium enterprises under the ease of doing business government agenda, my administration has implemented remarkable reforms over the years. These measures have not only improved the country's business climate, they have also mitigated the challenge and bottlenecks impacting business. The key reform that we have implemented include the full automation of business registration services, re-engineering of the application for power, water, and sewer connection, and the automation of the land registration process. In addition, we have adopted e-payment, e-filing, and e-service at the commercial divisions of the High Court and fully operationalized the Small Claims Court, which has seen disputes involving SMEs, mostly our young people, being resolved within a record 60 days and thus freeing capital locked up in legal disputes. Equally important is the full automation and streamlining of the payment of taxes in order to ease the burden of compliance and the redesigning of the, important, of the import and export processes, which has reduced the cost while improving efficiency of our ports, among other notable reforms. Mr. Speakers, as an affirmation that our reforms on ease of doing business are bearing div dividend, just last week, we scored a global first with the president of the European Investment Bank, who was in the country to witness the official opening of the European Investment Bank's first regional hub outside the European Union. The Nairobi the Nairobi Regional Hub will cover 11 countries in Eastern and Central Africa and will act as a pilot for the setting up of other EIB regional hubs into the future. This speaks to our administration's agenda to position Nairobi as an international financial center. But an even better example of COVID resilience is the strengthened relationship between the national and county governments. Although the National and County Government Summit has operated smoothly since it became effective, I must admit that the COVID pandemic revitalized its energy. Whenever we gathered as a summit during this crisis, the consciousness of the entire nation was called to order. We put asunder the political dynamics of the moment and our only business became Kenya. We demonstrated in word and in deed that devolution 
is a powerful driver of social economic development and it creates synergies and acceleration points that in turn generates tangible benefits for all Kenyans. We understood very well that to overcome the crisis, we had to act as one. Rather than allowing the nation to succumb to COVID fatigue, we came together and galvanized our people towards strength, resilience, and building back better. We are otherwise, we, where, where others stumbled and fell, we rose and soared. During the COVID stress period, the national and county governments demonstrated their true leadership. Nothing demonstrates this better than the strengthening of our healthcare systems under the dark cover of the COVID-19 pressure. When the COVID pandemic hit our country, we had ICU in, it, we had in ICU bed capacity only 180 beds countrywide. This translated to an average of two ICU beds in each county. But in the face of COVID, this reality was a disaster. But given the collaboration between the two levels of government, we increased ICU bed capacity by 502% during the COVID period. Equally important to note, during the COVID-19 pandemic, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we had the capacity only to generate 3 million liters of oxygen per day in March of 2020. Today, I am proud to say that we have improved our oxygen generation capacity in public health facilities by 10 times to 32 million liters per day as of October 2021. Kenya can be proud of one more innovation. In March of 2020, we had only one laboratory that could test notifiable diseases of international concern. In fact, we had to send our tests for notifiable diseases to South Africa. When the COVID pandemic hit our country, we had to wait five days for the South African laboratories to send us results. Today, we have moved from one testing laboratory to 95 well-equipped laboratories. What is it then that we have learned from the COVID disaster? We have learned that our solutions must be homegrown. That is why we have commissioned a vaccine development project for disruptive viruses like COVID-19 to serve not only Kenya, but the region at large. Mr. Speakers, a national, another national reminder of the opportunities we seized during COVID-19 was the site of the Likoni Channel crossing in Mombasa. Previous scenes of Mombasa res residents congested along the Likoni ferry are now a thing of the past. The iconic Likoni floating bridge, built in a record time of six months and opened to the public in December 2020, sees over 150,000 residents cross the channel on a daily basis in, order, in an orderly, safe, and secure manner. This has not only allowed for the efficient management of time and mobility across the channel, but significantly moderated the incidences of COVID-19 transmission and contributed to our overall disease mitigation strategy in the coastal region. Kenya has taken pride of place through this, initi through this initiative a first of its kind in the region, linking Liwatoni on Mombasa Island with Rasbofu on the Likoni mainland, and we intend to adopt such innovative approaches and learning to deliver on similar challenges in our various sectors. In sum, Mr. Speakers, COVID was both a danger and an opportunity. But because we focused on the opportunity side of the crisis, now Kenya has developed the necessary infrastructure for rolling out the universal health coverage outreach. But of equal importance, our COVID innovations in the area of health have propelled us to a place 
where Kenya can become a destination for health tourism for the region and beyond. Honorable members, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot end this COVID part of my address to Parliament without paying tribute to the people of Kenya for their commendable civic responsibility in the fight against COVID-19. While my administration provided leadership and action, our people supported us with self-sacrifice and civic duty. As you will recall very early in the pandemic, I did warn our people that the government cannot police the morality of its citizens. I warned that in a war against an invisible enemy like COVID, our former way of life would have to be adapted to a new normal where every Kenyan was his or her neighbor's keeper. In this new normal, citizens do not fight for liberties, they scramble for survival. When I made this call for civic responsibility in the face of COVID, I also emphasized that responsibility is not a burden, but it is a civic duty. I pay tribute to our fellow citizens for being responsible members of us. And indeed, as our forefathers stressed time and time again, our greatest strength will always be our unity. Today, I'm happy to report that despite the challenges and immense pressures and limits on our way of life, Kenyans did rise to the task and acted responsibly. Where others were reluctant, Kenyans gladly sacrificed for the good of the whole. For that reason, we were able to bend the curve and prevent the worst case scenarios. And due to this, and after careful consideration during the Mashujaa Day celebrations, I lifted the curfew and restriction of movement countrywide. Once again, as we have always done, we have shown that Kenyans are a people who put country above self, neighbor above individual, and we are a people who firmly believe in exercising our rights and freedoms in a responsible and purposeful manner. While a few battles have been won, the war against COVID is not yet won. And we cannot rest on our laurels. Now more than ever, we are faced with yet another variant of this coronavirus. The Omicron vi variant that is said to carry a higher risk of, inf of infection. This variant may explain infection rate spikes that we are witnessing across the globe. I did pledge to the nation in June of this year that by Christmas, we would have over 10 million adults vaccinated. As of today, we have achieved a target of 7.1 million Kenyans, up from 5 million as announced on Mashuja Day in October 2020. Mr. Speakers, to fortify our national resolve against COVID-19 and in honor of all those Kenyans that we have lost to the disease, I do urge today all Kenyan adults to visit their nearest medical facility to receive their COVID-19 vaccinations. The COVID-19 vaccines are in stock across our country and in all our counties, and already with a daily average rate of over 100,000 vaccinations, we have a much smaller target to meet within the next 25 days. I therefore once again call on all Kenyans to rally under the call of 25 days to Christmas to secure their vaccinations, to meet and surpass the target that we set ourselves. And I invite the media in all its various forums, forms to use their platforms to perform the social good and promote the vaccination campaign. This new variant's profile, as for now, remains unknown. It is therefore better to err on the side of caution. By receiving our vaccinations, we will have played our part in securing not only our own lives, but also
continue on our growth trajectory. No Kenyan should hold back from this perfectly safe and free way to protect yourself, your family, your neighbors, your colleagues, and the nation at large. Let us tear down this disease, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Speakers, throughout our history, the collective task of nation building has been guided by the shared aspirations of eradicating the indignities of ignorance, disease, and hunger. This was the vision that fueled our struggle for independence. Post-independence, every Kenyan generation and every administration since has sought to do all within its means to finally slay the three-headed monster that has plagued us for over many centuries. To steer the nation towards a path for the realization of these aspirations, the people of Kenya entrusted the responsibility of actualization of that vision on the elected and appointed state officials and officers to whom the powers of our nation have been delegated to. These elected appointed state officers include 47 governors, 350 members of the National Assembly, 67 members of the Senate, and 2,240 members of the county assemblies. We are many, but we must act as one. One government of Kenya that acts in unison to give the people of Kenya a better present and a brighter future. Our collective contributions to move the nation closest to our destiny of a more fair, just, and equitable Kenya for all builds on the intentions of previous administrations as supported by the Houses of Parliament and the organs of the state. I say this fully aware of the enormous work, that this enormous work cannot be concluded in one generation. Ours is a relay race, where we receive the baton and run the race and pass it on to our successors unbroken. Mr. Speaker says, the most notable intergenerational quest is what inspired the Big Four agenda as a strategic guide for my second term in office. To do so, my administration and our colleagues in both tiers of government had to make commitments towards a transformation in four key areas of intent. The first one is liberating our people from the poverty of dignity caused by inadequate services. The second is transitioning our people, especially our youth, from being recipients of handouts to producers of goods and services, as well as owners of capital. The third is building a holistic base of human capital that is food secure and health assured. And the fourth is the restoration of the dignity and the pride inherent of one owning a decent home. Mr. Speakers, I will now give an account of what my administration has done not only in the last year, but what we have attempted to do in the last eight years as well. And I will use the last eight years to give this August Houses a scale against which everything that my administration has achieved is to be measured. I will use history as a yardstick that we can borrow from to appreciate the achievements of our two tiers of government and our objective of delivery. The first area of thrust that I will report on is the state of our economic development. And I will borrow from the four legacy frames I articulated in my Madaraka Day speech of June 30th, 2020 in Kisumu City. Under the state of our economic development, I will report on two frames that have guided me and my administration. These are economic acceleration and the big push investments. Allow me, honorable members, to start with the economic acceleration, which is increasing the speed of achieving our economic goals. I also use the word acceleration to imply the mechanism 
of multiplying our economic fundamentals. When my administration took office in April of 2013, we were eager to multiply what was bequeathed to us. And I am happy to report to this parliament that we have multiplied our critical fundamentals in ways that even I did not imagine possible. For instance, in 2013, Kenya was Africa's 12th, 12th wealthiest nation with a GDP of 4.74 trillion Kenya shillings. This GDP was accumulated in a span of 123 years through four administrations before ours, because I include the colonial administration. In just eight years, my administration has multiplied the GDP by a factor of two plus. Today, our GDP stands at Kenya shillings 11 trillion, up from the 4.75 trillion, and from being ranked and from being ranked as the 12th wealth, wealthiest nation in Africa when I took over, we have now moved six ranks to become the sixth wealthiest nation in the continent on account of the choices that we have made. And as I said earlier, in the second quarter of this year, our real GDP grew by 10.1%, the first such growth in the history of our economy. The notable contributions to this growth include the ICT sector, which grew by a significant 25.1% in the second quarter of 2021. In fact, the ICT sector is projected to become a prime mover of our economic growth in years to come. Other sectors that contributed significantly to the real GDP in the, re in the reference quarter include the transport, se transport sector, which grew by 16.9%, and manufacturing, which grew by a record 9.6%. However, the hotel industry presents a more compelling picture of recovery from the COVID menace. At the height of the COVID pandemic in 2020, this industry registered a negative growth of 63.5% in the third quarter of 2020. During during the first quarter of 2021, this industry showed some improvement and contracted by 48.8%. By the second quarter of 2021, this industry was on a path of recovery and had grown by 9.1%, showing a remarkable upturn. Here, I look forward to all our international and global partners COVID will not be defeated by locking us all down and by shutting off parts of the world that you think are problematic. No one will be safe from COVID until we are all safe. Please, Jameni, tumefanya kazi, musitufungie tena Jameni. Honorable members, ladies and gentlemen, Given that we have doubled our GDP in a record eight years, it is no wonder that Kenya is projected to grow twice as fast as the sub-Saharan economies in the period of 2021 to 2022. And all this because of leadership and the power of choice. Allow me to give further example of acceleration and the multiplication of our fundamentals as a strategic intent of my administration. A case in point is that we have doubled our real GDP. We have also doubled our road network across the entire Republic. Besides the roads infrastructure, my administration has made the largest infrastructure project in a century with the construction of the standard gauge railway. In respect of roads infrastructure, when my administration came to the helm, there were 11,200 kilometers of tarmac road constructed by four previous administrations in 123 years. Like I said, I include the colonizers as well. In eight years, 
my administration has multiplied what the previous administrations have done by a factor of two. We have built 10,500 kilometers of road across the Republic and doing so 15, 15 times faster than previous administrations. And I will expound on this in a little while. Our railway, on the eve of the Madaraka day of the year 2017, we marked a transformative moment for Kenya and for Africa when the, the Madaraka Express made its inaugural journey from Mombasa to Nairobi. The largest infrastructure project in Africa had become a reality and a brand new modern railway had become a feature of our homeland and nation. Since then, the way we travel to Mombasa has been redefined. Madaraka Express, having served over 6,495,000 passengers while our cargo gets to the stores of our enterprises efficiently and on time with a record of 17.6 million tons of cargo transported from the 1st of January 2018 to yesterday, the 29th of November 2021. Turning to power generation, our acceleration model was applied to the production and distribution of electricity countrywide. When I took the oath of office in 2013, Kenya's total grid was 1,300 megawatts. But eight years later, Kenya's total grid has doubled and now stands at 2,600 megawatts. And this translates to approximately 325 megawatts installed every year under my administration. It means that for every year, we have installed 325 megawatts since 2013. Previous administrations installed a combined average of only 12 megawatts per year. Put differently, in, 80, in eight years, we have generated 40 times more power per year compared to the past. It is worth noting, honorable members, that 73% of this power is green. In fact, Kenya is leading the African continent in the generation of green energy. But this is not the only thing in Kenya. It is not the only thing which Kenya is leading the continent. I am proud to report that we have connected more power than in any other part of the country in just six years. In fact, Kenya is the leading country in Africa with respect to household connection electricity. In the eight years, we have connected 1.7 million more homes no, sorry, we have collected, connected 1.7 million more households than Egypt. Similarly, we have connected as many households as South Africa and Nigeria combined during the eight years of my administration. In real terms, only 2.3 million households had been connected to power when I took over in 2013. In eight years, we have tripled this number by connecting an extra 6.3 million households. Put differently, and guided by our acceleration model, we have connected approximately 787,000 households every year on average, and with 2,000 connections a day since 2013. By any measure, this acceleration is noteworthy. Besides access to electricity, my administration has embarked on implementing the recommendations of the Presidential Task Force that established a pathway for the reduction of the cost of electricity by 30% by the end of this year. Mr. Speaker, we are tearing down all barriers that deny Kenyans an opportunity to lead a dignified life. Now I turn to devolution and how my administration has used the acceleration framework to multiply the economic fundamentals of the counties. As the first president to implement the 2010 constitution, the task of rolling out devolution fell squarely on me. And although the letter of the constitution provided for a phased approach to devolution, to the devolution of functions to counties, 
the spirit of the Constitution suggested an urgent Big Bang approach in creating the devolved structures. This meant giving county governments political, administrative, and financial autonomy all at once. And we were to do this without the luxury of a strategy dry run to determine whether the Big Bang approach would work. Fortunately, Article 187 of the Constitution gave us three years to execute this constitutional instruction. While three years was a fair period to achieve the Big Bang effect of transferring functions to fragile counties, my administration chose an even bolder path. Driven by our acceleration doctrine, we chose to transfer functions to the county structures in one year instead of the constitutional threshold of three years. And because we were committed to the success of the countries, of the county's structures, we followed our accelerated devolution of function with two critical drivers. One, we undertook a massive transfer of highly skilled civil servants from the national government to the county governments. And this battery of highly trained personnel was meant to give county governments a head start. And they did so in terms of setting up the county public services, including their operating structures and systems. Two, within the first year of my tenure, my administration increased the equitable share allocation to county governments from the constitutionally mandated 15% to 32%. This was a doubling of the allocation in support of the execution of the devolution dream. And we did this because we understood and appreciated that devolution of functions without devolving of funding was an exercise in futility. Today, the national government has disbursed approximately 2.4 trillion to county governments over the last eight years. The aggregate amount that will have been dispersed to the counties for the next financial year will ensure that this figure surpasses the 3 trillion mark. In other words, this percolation of resources change the economic fundamentals at the county level. It has fast-tracked the embeddedness of devolved functions in eight years, and evidence abounds on this, but allow me to give a few examples. Accelerated devolution has, for instance, delivered shoes with a magical label made in Kitui County, Kenya, and given Makueni County its first mango processing plant Makueni County received 110 million from the Devolution Advice and Support Program. This money supported the processing plant and benefited 12,000 mango farmers by creating value addition. That plant is now buying one mango at 15 shillings from farmers who previously, who previously sold their produce in the open marketplace at five shillings at the very best. other than let their mangoes rot away. Their incomes have grown tenfold and provided ground for their farming undertakings to take off. Makueni is also on record as being one of the counties with the capacity to manufacture its own oxygen, especially in the context of COVID-19. And their universal health care insurance scheme, known as Makueni Care, is also a good example. Another example of county innovation is in Kajiado. In the wake of COVID-19 pandemic, the county looked for a way of distributing food to members of its populace through an integrated system dubbed, dubbed M. Riziki, which virtually linked financiers and beneficiaries, 30,000 households of their population in Kajiado were able to receive food using the system in 2020, M. Riziki saved the county the logistical nightmare of transportation and the digital platform also ensured that shopkeepers who partnered with the county were pro to, to provide goods remained in business during the COVID duress. 
This innovative approach in distributing relief food closed off avenues of corruption and created highly efficient ways of delivering services to the population. Honorable members, there are many more testimonials on how accelerating the formation of county structures and supporting them with skilled personnel, resources, and legislation has embedded devolution in the last eight years. One sleepy towns across the country have now roared back into life, driving not just grand infrastructure projects, but also tangible increases in household in incomes of ordinary Kenyans. Mr. Speakers, as devolution takes root, and as an affirmation of the equitable development we continue to enjoy, and in keeping with the resolution of the Senate, I will tomorrow, the 1st of December, 2021, have the high privilege on confer of conferring on Nakuru Municipality city status. Nakuru City will join Kisumu, Mombasa, and Nairobi as cities, and with their reputation as East Africa's cleanest town, all of Kenya looks forward to Nakuru City growing by leaps and bounds. So honorable members, I am happy to report to this august house that my administration has laid a firm and sound foundation for the devolved system of government, a foundation that has the potential to multiply the economic fundamentals of our county economies imme Im immeasurably. Ladies and gentlemen, you may ask why we choose to accelerate certain goals in our development agenda. Why do we choose to accelerate the issuance of title deeds, double our road network, build brand new railway lines, double our power production, double our GDP? Why has my administration taken such tremendous strides in creating accelerated development? Honorable members, it took England 200 years to industrialize. It took the United States of America 160 years and Japan 110 years. However, we look not to these nations, but to China, which has compressed their progressive economic change experience by these countries into a single generation. Instead of taking 200 years, instead of taking the 200 years it took England to industrialize, China took only 25 years. Similarly, the four Asian tigers of Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, and the Republic of South Korea took 25 years to industrialize instead of the hundreds of years it took others. And that is why their accelerated growth was called the Asian miracle. The secret to these miracles was acceleration. The Asian tigers, for instance, accelerated the achievement of its critical development fundamentals, and this allowed them to industrialize at a rate that was faster than normal. They contracted their development timelines by implementing aggressive interventions on multiple sectors of their economy simultaneously. This reduced the intervals between the phases of industrialization and allowed them to catch up with the West. And like these countries, the policy choices of my administration have been about contracting our development timelines through aggressive implementing, implementation of projects. We are moving with speed because there is no time like the present to deliver the dreams of Kenyans for a better tomorrow. If the acceleration model has worked for the Asian Tigers, who were at the same level of development as Kenya in 1965, they can work for us too. And if these countries industrialized in 25 years because of bold choices they made, we too can set the path for economic transformation and achieve it in record time, especially if we stop stealing. Mr. Speaker, allow me, allow me to report on the second frame of my development agenda, which I referred to in my Madaraka Day speech of this year as the big push investments. These are the bold undertakings that are futuristic in outlook. Most of these interventions are in the form of roads, rail, and ports. 
Some of them are revival of dead capital installed by previous administrations, which are nonetheless critical to our development path today. Regarding roads, the handiwork of my administration is evident across the entire country. There are some counties that have received their first tarmac roads since God made Kenya. And this was done during my administration. And as I said earlier, in eight years, we have built approximately the same number of kilometers of road that were built by the colonizers and the three previous independent administrations. And although our achievements in this area cannot be gainsaid, I want to reiterate that my administration was not building roads for their own sake. Ours was a quest to lay down tarmac for not for statistical purposes only. We realized that roads are literally the path to development and that every inch of tarmac we lay, we are accelerating businesses, creating the foundation for greater individual and national prosperity. We did it for you, the Kenyan people, to tear down the barriers that hold back every citizen from making their individual contributions to nation building. Take as an example the 27 kilometer Nairobi Expressway. Once completed next year, it will take 24 minutes to drive from Mlolongo in Machakos County to Rironi in Kiambu County. Currently, this journey takes three hours which is the equivalent of flying from Addis Ababa, flying to Addis Ababa and back to Kenya. Let me add that plans for the dual carriageway from Rironi, where the Nairobi Expressway will terminate, to Mao Summit are also at an advanced stage. And once completed, it will take 45 minutes to drive from Nairobi to Naivasha. Across the Republic, in every region, we are converting dusty Maram roads to world-class roads. Our dream is to create an efficient road network that links towns, cities, ports, stations, and markets to consumers. Over the last eight years, and for the first time since independence, Kenya is now linked to four of its five neighbors by tarmac roads. This is how we are facilitating the economic integration of our region, tearing down every barrier to the realization of our shared aspirations as a people. For instance, by linking our road networks to the Northern Corridor, we are plugging into the multimodal trade route that links the landlocked countries of the Great Lakes region with the Kenya Maritime Seaport of Mombasa. Similarly, the East African Coastal Corridor Development Project will link us along the coastline from Malindi through to Lunga Lunga up to Bagamoyo in Tanzania and on to Dar es Salaam. The corridor will promote tourism and trade along the Indian Ocean coast. Of equal note is the Sierrare Corridor, which will form an integral link to the northern coast. Sudan at Nakadok. With regard to ports, the development of Lamu port has been of particular pride to my administration. The port was first conceptualized in 1972, nine years after we gained independence. However, it took 39 years for works on the Lamu port of Lamu to commence. Through our futuristic model of big push investment, we have made it a reality in only eight years. The port of Lamu is the only post-colonial seaport in Africa built and financed by an African government. All, all other major, major seaports were built in the late 1800s or 1900s when most of Africa was under colonial rule. This port is therefore significant in terms of the futuristic thinking of 
our country. We are also in the process of building a road from Lamo through to Garissa and Isiolo, linking up to the Isiolo Moyale road and opening up the port of Lamo and the huge potential that exists in Northern Kenya and with our partners also in Ethiopia. End of part one. <laughs> interval, interval. <laughs> Hi. Honorable speakers, honorable members, because of the sheer depth and breadth of this port, it has the potential to reorganize the world's shipping networks by becoming a transshipment hub in Africa. Transshipment hubs are ports that allow large vessels that are unable to access destined ports of call due to their size. There are only five transshipment hubs globally, and, port, and the port of Lamo has the potential, honorable members, of becoming the sixth. If we remain focused on our development agenda, this will become a reality sooner than later. There is another strategic niche in the port of Lamo that is also futuristic. This port is placed right in the middle of the manufacturing hub of the Asia continent in the east and the heart of consumption in the west. The distance, honorable members, for example, between Shanghai the manufacturing hub of the East and Rotterdam, a major consumption port in the West, is approximately 12,000 nautical miles. But the distance between Rotterdam and Lamo is only 6,000 nautical miles. If we were to make the coastal region an outsourced manufacturing hub for Western products, the port of Lamo has the potential to cut the price of these products by half. And this would be based purely on shipping costs because the port of Lamo is half the distance to the west compared to the port of Shanghai. If we are to see the port of Lamo through these futuristic lenses, we will exploit our geographical advantages to make an imprint, an imprint on global trade. Another big push investment that we have made in support of regional trade through our ports is the expansion of the Kipevu oil refinery and oil terminal. For 128 years, Kenya has served the five countries of the region using only one oil berth at the Kipevu oil terminal. This single oil berth could only handle one vessel at a time, and for the most part, it took one vessel days to offload its fuels. This meant that other vessels in the queue to offload had to wait, incurring huge demolish charges and penalties by oil marketers. The results and cost of these inefficiencies are borne by the Kenyan consumer, which overall makes our economy uncompetitive. This year alone, we lost an average of one billion shillings in the first four months in demolish at the old Kipevu oil terminal. To tear down the barriers that make our country uncompetitive, we have now put in place a new oil terminal that I shall be opening soon, that will accommodate up to four vessels at a time. And instead of taking a whole day of loading fuel, each of the four vessels will take five hours to offload their fuel cargo. This means that every terminal will have the capacity to handle over 20 vessels a day. Put differently, if the old terminal handled 300 fuel vessels per year on average, the new terminal has the capacity to handle 7,300 vessels annually. Coupled with the improved transportation system connecting Kenya with its neighbors, the expanded capacity will boost our regional trade as well as remove the cost of demurrage and penalties that the Kenyan consumer has to pay. 
Mr. Speaker, one of my administration's key priorities has also been to revive state undertakings that have been designated as dead capital. I have done this as part of our big push investment because the utility of these state undertakings could not be allowed to go to waste. To increase the speed of reviving this debt capital, I elected to use the Kenya Defense Forces because of their unity of command, military efficiency, and reasonable pricing. As an example, after KDF took over the Kenya Meat Commission, they turned it around in just a few months. Whereas previously, it took farmers four years to be paid, they are now paid in 72 hours. KMC has resuscitated the outlets that KMC have, collecting today approximately 1 million shillings every day. Previously, this outlet collected 8,000 shillings daily. This 1 million translates to 30 million every month and Kenya shillings 3.6 billion annually in just one outlet. Before September 20th, such revenue would have been impossible because slaughtering was limited to a few or no animals in a month. To enhance further the profitability of KMC, we have linked it to another dead capital that my administration has revived. The meter gauge railway from Nairobi to Nyanyuki, which has been revived under the KDF. The KMC is now using it to transport more than 200 animals weekly. Another aspect of the KMC re-engineering supply chain is the relationship with the Iwasiniro South Development Authority. This authority has a tannery and leather factory, which the KMC has been supplying with hides and skins. Although the factory is still not yet complete, it has so far produced about 840,000 square feet of finished leather, partly from KMC supplies. And once complete, it is expected to produce over 1.2 million square feet of finished leather per year. Apart from the revival of KMC, the Nairobi Nyanyuki Railway, in partnership with the Kenya Railway Corporation and KDF, has revamped the 217-kilometer Nairobi Kisumu Railway, a railway that had been abandoned for over two decades. But today, it now boasts 18 stations, 46 bridges, and 27 viaducts. Together with the revival of the port of Kisumu, revamping the railway line is meant to enhance connectivity with our neighboring countries who depend on Kenya for their transportation of their imports and exports. Another uplifting story of revival of dead capital is our big push in investment in the port of Sumu and the reconditioning of MV Uhuru vessel to transport fuel prior by road from Kisumu or Eldoret to Uganda took 72 hours because of the long queues at the Malaba border. But to transport fuel from the port of Kisumu to Port Bell in Uganda by ship takes only 12 hours. This means that by the time a tanker makes one trip to Uganda by road, MV Uhuru will have made six. There is the question of volume. One tanker carries 20,000 liters of fuel, but one wagon abroad, MV Uhuru carries 60,000, which is three times the size of a tanker. Secondly, for all our customers in Uganda and through to the DRC, issues of losses that used to amount to approximately 10 percent and issues of adulteration <laughs> in Asia. Yeah. to date we have transported over 80 million liters of fuel across lake victoria to uganda mr speaker my administration has set in motion the process of reviving the blue economy. A blue economy strategy is set to reclaim all fish landing sites is in place. And we have set up a coast guard to secure our maritime assets 
and we have come up with a legal framework that will ensure that all fish caught in Kenyan waters are landed in Kenya. It is worth for this, for Parliament to note that in the 1990s, Kenya used to process 5% of the global loin tuna catch. This was produced by a company known as Wanainchi Marine Products Limited, based in Liwatoni in Mombasa. When this company, for reasons, collapsed, Kenya's tuna was extracted by other countries and resold in foreign markets. Inability to export our tuna resources has seen Kenya lose a potential revenue of Kenya shillings three trillion since 1982, when the exclusive economic zone was set up by the United Nations. And to revive this debt capital, my administration formed the Kenya Fishing Industries Corporation in 2019 to regulate the exploration of Kenya's maritime and fish products. This corporation took over from the defunct Wanainchi Marine Products, and it is in the process of setting up marine landing sites and processing plants in Lamu, Chimoni, and Libatoni. Once fully operational, the goal is to land 300,000 metric tons of tuna every year and to employ a workforce of approximately 60,000 people. This industry, has the potential to rake in for Kenya 200 billion shillings. Overall, as we seek to improve our infrastructure, our commitment to sustainable development is uncompromising. It is the solemn duty of present generations to consciously conserve their natural, their natural beauty, ecological splendor, and pristine environment that we received from our forefathers and from generations before them. And this to pass on to future generations in as a good state as we can, unbroken as it was given to us, if not in better condition. In this regard, I note with satisfaction that our Greening Kenya campaign continues to gain momentum. And as a result, approximately 71,794 kilometers squared of our, of our homeland currently constituted of tree cover, representing 12.12%, while 52.279 hectares uh, kilometer squared of our country is under forest cover, which represents 8.3, 8.83, up from 6% previously. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speakers, we are indeed on course to meet our target of 10% forest cover by the year 2024. For, for trees are without doubt the lungs of our nation. Mr. Speaker, now I turn to the third frame, which I have used to organize the achievements of the achievement of goals in my administration. I call it the restoration of dignity, and it is a campaign against the three enemies identified by our forefathers out of ignorance, poverty, and disease. The founding fathers of our nations define dignity as freedom from want and freedom from fear. They taught us, they taught us that there is no self-rule where there is no self-worth. And under this frame, I will report on the state of our water, health, education, and security sectors. Where there, is, where there is no access to clean drinking water, there is no dignity. And that is why my administration prioritized and succeeded in providing 35 million people with access to clean water. When I took office in 2013, our entire country was served by just 99 public boreholes. In the past financial year alone, we have managed to sink 262 public boreholes, and today more than 2,511 public boreholes have been sunk since 2013, a 25-fold increase in the previous number of boreholes. In order to continue this widening of access to clean water, my administration has over the years invested over 200 billion to implement various dams and other integrated community projects that will increase water supply 
apply to vulnerable communities. In the Nairobi metropolitan area alone, the project is set to supply 41.3 million liters of water per day to an additional 2.1 million residents. This is critical because the poverty of dignity is most pronounced in water scarce economies of the informal settlements and in vulnerable communities. For instance, as is known by some members here, the average daily consumption of water per household in informal settlements in Nairobi is 40 liters. If the price of 40 liters is 40 shillings, a household will have to spend 1,200 shillings per month buying water alone. This is 20% of the income of an average family in most of our informal settlements. And for the most part, the price of water has been higher than that of rent. The poverty of, dig the poverty, the poverty of dignity is well in, uh, illustrated when one considers that the price of water for the rest of Nairobi is Kenya shillings 46 per 1,000 liters. Put differently, the dwellers of our informal settlements have been paying 25 times more for water compared to the rest of Nairobi dwellers. And this is why the Nairobi Metropolitan Service has set up 1,600 water points in all our informal settlements to supply free water to the residents. This initiative has saved dwellers of these settlements up to 20% of their incomes and approximately 1,200 shillings per household. And this is what I call freedom from want. Mr. Speaker, one of the most indignifying challenges of our people has been the high cost of health care. There are many testimonies of how families have had to sell ancestral land to cater for high medical bills. This not only rips them of their dignity, but also deprives future generations of ancestral address. The objective of my administration is to end this by providing 100% universal health coverage for essential health services by starting this year. The constitutional right to health care is the element that my administration has been consistently working to fulfill by investing in health facilities, medical equipment, and human resources for health. Our success in this area has been lauded internationally. According to Healthcare Index, which gives a single measure of the state of each country's health system based on data provided by the World Health Organization, Kenya today ranks third behind South Africa and Tunisia among the most improved health systems in Africa in the year 2020. To achieve this, my administration has had to work to increase affordability and availability of healthcare services for all Kenyans. Access speaks to the geographical availability of healthcare facility services, affordability to both the cost of healthcare services and the ability of Kenyans to pay for these medical services. And availability speaks to the extent to which our healthcare facilities have the necessary resources to meet the health needs of Kenyans. In terms of access to healthcare, when my administration took over in 2013, the number of health facilities across the country stood at 4,430. My administration, in conjunction with county governments, has increased our medical facilities by 43% by building an additional 1,912 new hospitals in the last eight years. This is an average of 239 new facilities per year. In context, in previous 118 years, only 4,430 hospitals had been built in Kenya, an average of 37 hospitals per year. We have built, during that period, six times more hospitals than over all the four previous administrations. To increase access to specialized medical services and to decongest Kenyatta National Hospital, my administration has upgraded two hospitals to, ref hospitals to referral status during my term. The, upgrading, the upgraded hospitals are the Kenyatta University Teaching Referral Research Hospital and its Integrated Molecular Imaging Center in Nairobi County and the Kenyatta Hospital Complex in Odaya in Nyeri County. The Odaya Annex is currently serving eight countries in the central Kenya region. To ensure that access to healthcare 
is cascaded to the lowest administrative unit. Level 5 hospitals have also increased by 44%. Level 4 hospitals increased by 9%. Level 3 hospitals by 34%. And level 2 hospitals increased by 49%. Regarding affordability of health care, my administration has consistently increased the annual allocations to the Ministry of Health. Kenya today has the highest budgetary allocation for health in East Africa, which currently stands at 121.1 billion for the year 2021. Our sizable health budget will be used to expand access to primary health care services, ensure free maternity care, eliminate user fees for public primary care facilities and subsidize health insurance insurance for the elderly and people with severe disabilities my administration has also allocated 900 million as conditional grants to support the implementation of free primary health care in all our 47 counties the highest allocation in conditional grants was to rift valley region at Kenya shillings, 247.19 million Kenya shillings. The NHIF supercover launched in July of 2015 is another initiative of my administration to guarantee affordability of healthcare. Through this cover, dialysis patients and cancer patients are able to pay for their treatments locally or abroad where the specific treatment is not available in our country's public hospitals. In the financial year 2019-2021, NHIF managed to pay for 4.4 million hospital visits, covering 1.4 million cases of inpatient and 3 million cases of outpatient services. This in turn saved Kenyan households approximately 54.9 billion in financial losses brought about by health-related issues. With a monthly subscription of Kenya Shillings 500, the NHIF SupraCover has become Kenya's largest and most reliable, accessible, and affordable medical insurance cover. Over the last eight years of my administration, NHIF's membership has steadily grown. So far, the total NHIF membership stands at 10.5 million members, up from just 4 million members in 2013. Mr. Speakers, I acknowledge with appreciation that the National Assembly recently passed the National Hospital Insurance Fund Amendment Bill 2021, and the same is now presently before the Senate. I today urge through you, Mr. Speaker, that the Senate expedite the consideration of this bill so that in the life of this House, we can all join in ushering in universal health coverage for all our people. Mr. Speaker, honorable members, let us tear down the barriers that inhibit our quest to deliver quality health care for all Kenyans. To improve the standard of health care facilities, my administration has boosted bed capacity, improved access to medical equipment, and increased the number of medical training schools. In 2013, for example, the total bed capacity in public health facilities stood at 56,000 hospital beds. This has increased by 47% to 82,000 hospital beds in 2020. The northeastern region of our country has experienced the highest expansion in hospital bed capacity, up from 2,443 hospital beds in 2013 to 4,506 566 hospital beds in 2021. This is followed by the Nyanza region, which has experienced an expansion in bed capacity of 63 percent from 9,249 hospital beds in 2013 to 15,054 hospital beds in 2020. Nairobi has also experienced an expansion of 57 percent from 7,866 hospital beds in 2013 to 10,399 hospital beds in 2021. Through the Managed Equipment Service Project, my administration has supplied 1,241 pieces of specialized medical equipment 
with 130, 13 hospitals being equipped in 47 counties at a cost of Kenya shillings, 43 billion. In 2013, when I took over, there were 26 dialysis machines countrywide. Today, that number stands at 603 dialysis machines. These machines have thus far benefited 383,000 patients, and through the NHIF scheme, they have saved Kenyans approximately 2.3 billion Kenya shillings. Similarly, we have increased the number of radiology and imaging machines across the Republic. Using the health insurance scheme, this has benefited 4,534,000 4, patients and saved Kenyans a total of 47.6 billion. Mr. Speakers, to add another arrow in our agenda on the management of cancer as part of our universal health coverage, about one month ago, I presided over the official opening of the Integrated Molecular Imaging Center at the Kenyatta University Referral Hospital. The groundbreaking facility is not just the first of its kind in Kenya, but for the entire sub-Saharan region. As a result, many of our patients suffering from cancer will now have the, the, the benefit of early detection, leading to early treatment and cure, and thus saving many, many lives. This will in turn relieve our families of acute financial stress and burden that comes with a cancer diagnosis and the physical and emotional burden that comes along with the management of the disease. Honorable members, regarding medical training, the number of Kenya medical training college, college campuses has increased from 28 campuses in 2013 to 71 campuses today. This year, the number of graduates of KMTC was 3,319 compared to 111 graduates when I took over in 2013. Similarly, the number of medical doctors trained annually has shot up from 620 in 2013 to 900 doc medical doctors in 2021. Finally, with regard to health, my administration has prioritized the universal achievement of the right to reproductive health care as required by our constitution. Indignity takes many forms, and the most violating forms of these that disposit that indignity takes many forms, and the most violating forms of these that dispossesses mothers, and that is why my administration has committed itself to providing the highest standard of reproductive health through three free maternity care. In 2016, my administration introduced the Linda Mama program, which has led to the increase of birth deliveries by skilled providers from 43% to currently 62%. This has also fostered a decline in maternal mortality rates by 26%. Under Linda Mama, all pregnant women are eligible for free maternity health care, and even those women not covered under NHIF each mother is allocated between 2,500 and Kenya shillings 30,000, depending on whether the birth is normal or by cesarean section. Thus far, Linda Mama has benefited 5.8 million Kenyan women and has saved Kenyans 81.4 billion through the health insurance component of the program. With Linda Mama, I am confident that we can achieve the freedom from want for our vulnerable mothers, and now our children can be born in dignity. On liberating our people from poverty of dignity and making them health assured, a good example is the work of the Nairobi Metropolitan Service. During one of my inspection tours during the COVID period in Mukuru Kwa Ruben, I was saddened to learn that 500,000 people were being served by a private health facility which only had eight beds a woman giving birth in this facility could not be admitted for more than two hours in fact after giving birth she had to get out 
in one or two hours in order to give way for other patients. The only time that she can stay for a day is if she has complications and cannot be transferred immediately by a family member to an alternative facility. This is not a problem. This is not poverty. If this is not poverty of dignity, I don't know what is. To resolve this embarrassment and to enhance access to quality health care for our fellow citizens living in informal settlements, I ordered for the establishment of 15 fully health fledged health uh, centers within the Nairobi metropolis. Among them, Mudua Udhiru Health Center, Tasia Health Center, Gumba Madare Health Center, Lakisama Health Center, Kayole Soweto Dispensary. Besides the 15 above, construction works are also under ongoing in regard to an additional 10 facilities within the metropolis. Mr. Speaker, enabling Kenyans to have decent and affordable homes has been one of the pillars of the Big Four agenda, and the affordable housing program has been, over the last four years, my keen intention. We have had problems in passing legislation before this house but I can happily say that despite this, we have seen an increase in private investment also in the housing sector, amounting to some 2.12 trillion Kenya shillings. And these investments have yielded over 186,000 housing units, a remarkable 43% increase of housing units compared to the year 2013-2017. The general prices of houses have decreased slightly and we must continue to see what it is that we can do together to increase and uh, the amount available in terms of affordable housing. And this will therefore result in many more Kenyans being able to enjoy the dignity and pride that comes with owning a home. To institutionalize this affordable housing program into prosperity and in partnership with some of our development partners we have also established the Kenya Mortgage Refinance Company. This financing powerhouse provides long-term large-scale funding to banks and circles which in turn avails these funds to home buyers at flexible and affordable interest rates of below 10 percent. Therefore the dream of owning a home today is a greater possibility to many more of our fellow citizens than it was four years ago. But here, honorable members, there is much more that we can do. Mr. Speaker, food security is another key pillar of the Big Four agenda, and to ensure significant improvement in farm productivity and by enhancing the quality of farm inputs and reducing reliance on rain-fed agriculture. In the last year, we have seen the price of maize meal retailing between Kenya shillings 95 and Kenya shillings 105. However, despite a bunk, bumper crop in some parts of our country, due to the poor performance of the short rains in 2020 and the long rains this year, parts of our country have suffered severe drought situations. And as a result, 2.1 million of our fellow citizens are food insecure. The recurrence of drought is a phenomenon that successive administrations have grappled with, with little success. And even though we have made progress in the mitigation of drought, the progress has not been fast enough. So as part of our state response, we launched an elaborate framework for ending drought emergencies in Kenya. The framework fo focused on investing in interventions that will build the resilience of all vulnerable households to drought. This included over Kenya shillings 25 billion investments in the foundations of development of such as sustainable peace building, conflict management, water harvesting, and supply, and supply road construction and improvement, education and training, health and nutrition services. In addition, investment in community-based resilience and drought preparedness projects has also been accelerated 
through the support of the national as well as county governments, as well as our development partners. The aim of this investment is to improve the livelihoods of vulnerable households by diversifying their livelihoods. As part of, as we respond to the current drought, we have commenced with a livestock offtake program and initiated support to the affected citizens in a dignified manner through the crash cash transfer system which is a cash transfer system of stipends to affected families that replaces the dignity of having to queue for the distribution of food portions. Mr. Speaker, the government will continue to support all vulnerable households and will endeavor to ensure that notwithstanding the severity of the winds of drought, that no Kenyan will die of hunger. If dignity is freedom from want, accompanied by freedom from fear, then I can confirm to this house that we have done a lot to liberate our people from want. But I also want to underscore that maybe more has to be done to liberate our people from fear. That more has been done to liberate our people from fear, yet very little has been spoken about it. Today, and with your indulgence, speakers, I will go on record in this house as having been the commander-in-chief that steered the implementation of the most consequential and ambitious transformation of our security sector. And we did this because my administration appreciated that to have the freedom from fear, our security sector has to be in good form. To give an example, the police to population ratio today is at its highest level ever as prescribed by the UN standard. Our police complement has received an additional 47,000 new recruits since who have joined the service from the year 2013 to date. Similarly, over the last eight years, we have undertaken the most consequential an expansive modernization of our military. And in fact, the reform undertakings in the military are actually unparalleled in our nation's history. We have invested substantially in building new uh, uh, um, uh, barracks. We have invested in military manufacturing capabilities that have not only resulted in the spurning, uh, spurring of previously dormant sectors but the creation for jobs for young people, both directly and through ancillary services. For the first time in Kenya's history, we are producing our own light weapons and military uniform and other equipment and supplies that were previously imported. We have, as a result, employed over 600 young people in these industries in high-paying, high-skilled jobs and saved our country a lot in foreign exchange. We have achieved knowledge and technology transfer for the growth and anticipated future development. And this is because I am determined to tool and to retool our security forces to the highest standards attainable. And this is the only way we will guarantee freedom from fear for our people and indeed secure our territorial integrity. Mr. Speaker, sir, on territorial integrity, I want to go on record in this house that our forefathers bequeathed us our homeland and nation. The government of Kenya will do everything possible to preserve the territory of this great republic and ensure and ensure that generation after generation of Kenyans dwell in it as it is, in fact, intact and unencumbered. Mr. Speaker, honorable members, as I have said before, not an inch more and not an inch less. <laughs> honorable speakers, this aside, I want to say that the health of our security system is not only as good, 
that the health sorry let me start that again honorable speakers this aside i want to say that the health of a security system is only as good as the health of its officers and this is why i have invested in the social welfare of personnel charged with the security of our nation we have viewed their enumeration allowances benefits housing and insurance and we have also increased the capacity of their health facilities of the health facilities used by our security organs in particular we have recently established a new level four hospital in kahawa garrison and soon i will be in isiolo opening another level four hospital i recently commissioned a trauma and counseling center in manda in lamu county and we shall also be breaking ground on an additional three level four hospitals one in eldered for the defense forces one in roiro for the prison services and one in bagadi for the national police service the upgrade of the forces memorial hospital to a level five facility is set to begin early next year and in addition there is the ongoing construction of the very first level six hospital for the defense forces of Waiyaki way in nairobi our focus on military and police housing will further augment the social support structures that we have prioritized for our disciplined forces. In addition to ongoing initiatives to improve on police housing, the government will later this month, that is me, not, I'm not the government, but I, <laughs> will later this month, later in the month of December, break ground, uh, break ground for the building of 3,500 houses for our military officers. Mr. Speaker, since I came into office in 2013, we have embarked on a path that has placed human development at our foremost priority. A nation is more than boundaries, borders and territory. A nation is her people. To judge a nation, one must examine the lives of ordinary citizens and the extent to which they can access basic requirements owed to them and the quality of this access is what gives them dignity. And the heart of that development of our nation is the development of a dignified citizen. And I believe that education is the gateway to this development, a gateway that tears down inequality. And that is why today I am pleased to report on the gains that we have made in the last eight years in the sector of education. By the year 2030, our population is expected to be about 63 million. And out of this, about 38% of Kenya's population will be ca ca categorized as school going. This means that two out of every five Kenyans will be in school. And in order to meet the ever growing demand of the global landscape, of this global landscape, we must prepare the next generation now, today, and not tomorrow. And that is why we have been committing each year to channeling a substantial amount of our national budgetary resources to our education sector. In the past financial year, we have ensured that about a quarter of our national budget was allocated to education. And in a call to action endorsed by several heads of state and government at this year's Global Education Summit, that Kenya was privileged to lead alongside the United Kingdom, my administration pledged to allocate 26% of our national expenditure to education in the coming financial year. And this, I believe, is an unachievable target given that our current apportionment stands slightly less than a quarter. These dedicated funds have allowed us to achieve, achieve what was previously thought to be impossible goals. In 2009, the first year of free secondary education witnessed a 66.9% transition from primary to secondary school. But by 2018, we had increased that transition rate 
to 85.5%. And today, we can proudly report that we have secured a true 100% transition rate for three successive, successive years in our primary to secondary system. Equally important is to note that we have now achieved the global feat of a one-to-one -one book ratio in all our public primary and secondary schools. This has improved the quality of education and reduced the cost of education on parents. To further ensure that no Kenyan child is left behind and therefore to effectively enhance the delivery of the compulsory basic education from primary through to secondary school, I am pleased to report to the House that since 2013, we have recruited an additional 107,000, well, sorry, 107,000 teachers approximately comprising of 54,775 primary school teachers and 52,453 secondary school teachers. Our enhancement of manpower in these institutions of basic education by over 25% has significantly mitigated the shortage of teachers in the country and in turn bridged the teacher to student ratio. Honorable members, ladies and gentlemen, in order to continue with these achievements, we need to secure the entire education ecosystem. We need to ensure that there is adequate infrastructure, comprehensive policy choices, skilled educators, and a healthy learning environment. In support of this, my administration has grown the number of schools at the pre-primary and primary school levels from 3,764 in 2007 to 10,118 in 2021. And we are building an average of over 1,265 schools each year. Additionally, since 2013, the electrification of schools has been a priority and currently over 90% of schools are connected to the grid. This has led to improved learning outcomes and enhanced utilization of technology, including modern mass media tools in the classroom. Another critical plank is education reforms is securing the large tenure of our educational institutions. The founding technocrats of our nation did not envision a situation where secure tenure for schools would be an issue in the future. And that is why they never secured the title deed for our schools. But today we know different. Our school titling program, therefore, has become increasingly important. As of 2015, only 4,900 schools had been titled since independence. Today, over 12,000 schools out of a total of 32,354 have been issued with title deeds because of a multi-agency effort. In guaranteeing public schools their titles, my administration has upheld the fundamental right of education and in initiated a process to ensure that there is no school sitting on land that it does not own. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> honorable speaker, honorable members, let me conclude my address by speaking about <laughs> Let me conclude my address by speaking about the fourth frame that has guided my administration, and I call it political stabilization, which is the doctrine that guided me to a path of a handshake with the right Honorable Raila Amolo Odinga. <laughs> Honorable members, undoubtedly, as I have tried to explain my administration has secured an impressive economic acceleration, including the doubling of our GDP from 4.74 trillion to 11 trillion shillings. 
We have also made big push investments that have spurred development, revived debt capital, and boosted entrepreneurship. We have also restored dignity to our people through water and sanitation, healthcare, education, roads, and security reforms. However, all of this would amount to very little without political stabilization. If every five years, toxic political climate and election time tensions would reverse the gains painfully secured, our impressive development record of accomplishment would be an immense tower, sadly built on sand, but not rock. For the record, political stabilization is not an end in itself. It is a continuous process that every administration, even those that come after me, must apply their minds to and secure. And let me explain. Next month, we will be celebrating 30 years of political pluralism gained following the reintroduction of multi-party politics through the repeal of Section 2A of the former Constitution on the 10th of December, 1991. From the Mulolongo voting system of the Kanuera to our vibrant democracy today, we must celebrate the journey that we have taken and the expanded fields of freedom that we enjoy. While undoubtedly multi-party politics has been a much better democratic platform than the single party state, we must not ignore the very real negative aspects of our politics and electioneering. The evidence of this is plainly observable in the elections of 1992, 97, 2007, 2013, and 2017, and only in 2002, when well, yours truly surrendered easily, <laughs> is the only one that did not have a problem. In 1992, the election cost us Kenya shillings 248 billion in lost economic growth. Lives were lost and populations displaced. And during this election, Kenya's foreign direct investment at the time fell by two thirds from Kenya shillings 1.8 billion to Kenya shillings 600 million. In 2007, the election eroded the equivalent of Kenya shillings economic growth in a matter of days. Lives were lost and populations displaced, just as had been the case to a far lesser extent in 1997. In 2017, we lost close to Kenya shillings 1 billion every working hour for the 123 days we held the election. And in fact, in 2017 election, the economy lost approximately 1 trillion in response to that particular electioneering period. And the question I pose therefore to the leadership of this country present here today is this, is this right? Is this trajectory the logical path that our country should take? Thank you. And as I have said before, our country has been in a constitutional moment since 2017. The only question is what should we do with this constitutional moment? If we do not embrace it, how will it return to punish our nation? And if we embrace it, who are the winners and losers of that moment? That, honorable members, is the question before us today. The parliamentary record as well as history reflects that during this reporting period, my administration did attempt to resolve the constitutional dilemma facing our country. We went to the people and five million Kenyans agreed to initiate the process of putting the first amendment to the 2010 constitution to a vote. The first amendment, honorable members, was thereafter taken to county assemblies where it received nearly unanimous endorsement. 
in this august parliament the people's elected representative gave the first mandate a clear nod of approval by a margin by a margin in excess of two-thirds if indeed and i speak to those that need to listen to this if indeed Article 1 of the 2010 Constitution states that all sovereign power rests in the people of Kenya and can be exercised either directly or through their representatives, the people made their voices heard with regard to the First Amendment. They exercise this power directly through the IBC petition for constitutional change, they made this petition indirect, this uh, petition indirectly through the county assemblies and parliament, and the record of parliament attests to the fact that the people of Kenya wanted a constitutional change, but a few individuals sat down in a back room and they decided otherwise. <laughs> that said, and this being a house of records, I must record what we lost from the First Amendment. And I am doing this for parliamentary record and for posterity. The first loss was equity in resource allocation. It, in missing the First Amendment to the 2010 Constitution, Kenya missed the possibility to increase the minimum county allo allocation from the current 15% to 35%. My administration, as I mentioned earlier, has increased this allocation to 30% but this only through administrative fiat. But to anchor this goodwill in the Constitution so that devo devo devolution is embedded, we wanted a constitutional amendment that was clear and certain. This, honorable members, did not happen. Had this amendment been adopted, counties would have by law received Kenya shillings 562 billion instead of the 316 billion allocated to them in the 2020-21 budget, an increase of over 75% of their current allocation. The second loss, honorable members, from the First Amendment was proportional representation. Proportionality is about the equitable distribution of resources amongst all groups and on this particular point, I just want to focus on one, gender balance among. <laughs> the First Amendment to our Constitution would have ensured that 50% of all senators were women. And the logic here was to ensure that if we percolate the proposed 35% of our national revenues to counties, women should be at the center of decision-making on how this revenue is utilized. But honorable members, this did not happen. The third loss was about expanding our national executive to accommodate a broader face of Kenya and to expand representation. This would have constitutionalized the end of the winner takes all outcomes of elections that creates that create creates so much toxicity and tension again honorable members this did not happen honorable members we cannot behave like the proverbial ostrich and bury our heads in the sand a constitutional moment does not resolve itself simply by being ignored the need for political stabilization is, I believe, the most urgent task facing Kenyans today. And it is the foundation, and it is the foundation upon which 
uh, greater justice, fairness, health, wealth, and security will be built on. And for this reason, I want to believe, honorable members, that that which did not happen will happen. Honorable speakers, ladies and gentlemen, I have given an account of my tenure in office for the last eight years with a focus on the last year. I want to thank all members of parliament in both houses for their individual and collective contribution to the realization of our legislative agenda. Over this last year, the National Assembly considered and passed 30 bills, while the Senate passed 19 bills, out of which three bills have received presidential assent, while 16 others are before the National Assembly. Mr. Speaker, I also note with appreciation that the National Assembly considered and approved four session of papers, 36 statutory instruments, 15 treaties over the past one year, including the economic partnership agreement between the Republic of Kenya and the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. As you are aware, there are a number of critical legislative proposals emanating from the executive, which are still pending in parliament. And to that end, I urge parliament to expedite and conclude on the legislative process so that we can have those urgently needed pieces of legislation in place. My administration has also submitted the Huduma Bill, which is so far conclusively institutionalized the reforms of the national identity, ecosy national identity ecosystem through the establishment of the National Integrated Identity Management System. The other seminal legislative proposals include the Political Parties Amendment Bill, the Political Party Membership Regulation, the Government Contracts Bill, the Kenya National Bud Transfusion Bill, the Irrigation Amendment Bill 2021, the Irrigation Amendment Bill, the Kenya National Library Services Bill, the Proceeds of Crime and Anti-Money Laundering Amendment Bill 2021, and once enacted into law, the Proceeds of Crime and Anti-Money Laundering Amendment will enhance the integrity of our financial system by closing the last loopholes in our war against money laundering and other um, such maneno. <laughs> this amendment is not in any way expected to erode a key talent, tenant of the legal practice of advocate-client privilege. <laughs> I, however, note that on this Friday, on Friday this week, Parliament shall proceed to its traditional long recess. To that end, through you, honorable speakers, I urge Parliament to consider adjusting its calendar to ensure that all the critical legislation and legal instruments, including those related to elections, are concluded in a timely manner. As we look for the future, honorable members, I see great promise. However, just as I said earlier, we must be bold enough to shape it. In just about eight years, our national development blueprint, Kenya Vision 2030, will have run its course, and with it will come the dawn of the fourth decade of the 21st century. By 2030, Kenyans will, Kenya will be home to about 63 million of us. The foundation that successive administrations have built will bear true dividends if we boldly reimagine our futures. But if we go it alone, we might not secure the best opportunities for our children. In my eyes, our best chance as individual African nations is to embrace a continent where there is free movement of persons, goods, services, and capital, as is characterized under the Africa Free Trade Arrangement. This is because, as I have said before, we are not competitors, but rather comrades with a shared dream which will be achieved much faster through collaboration. The Pan-African dream of our founding fathers that is inspired the establishment of the organization 
of African unity that transitioned ultimately to the African Union must transcend to being beyond an inspiration. For Kenya to lead towards this course on assuming the presidency for my second term, I issued a directive that any African wishing to visit Kenya would be eligible to receive a visa at the point of entry. I did this in the full realization that to secure the prosperity of Kenyans, East Africans and Africans, we must begin in earnest to break down the walls that divide and separate us. So Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Speakers, I challenge Parliament to put in place a legal framework to lead to closer union with our brethren in East Africa and across the continent and to advocate for a shared, for shared prosperity, greater fraternity and greater security in Africa. Mr. Speaker, this intent must however be preceded by a solidification of the various regional blocks and in particular our own East African community. I say this because the whole whole is greater than the sum of its parts. When each part appreciates its role and the contribution of other parts, then the body is able to function effectively. The African Union will only be strong and vibrant when our regional blocks are of similar character. We must simultaneously re-energize our common bond as brothers and sisters in East Africa, even as we craft a path to the single African Union. This, Mr. Speaker, is the future that I see. And Mr. Speakers, lead, these, lead these, this parliament in tearing down these barriers. So honorable speakers, honorable members, it is now my high privilege and extreme pleasure to submit to parliament the following three reports as required by the Katiba. A, report on measures taken and progress achieved in the realization of our national values 2020, report on progress made in fulfilling the international obligations of the Republic 2020, and C, report on the state of security of Kenya 2020. I have the pleasure of submitting alongside the constitutionally required reports, the report on the, clim on the Kenya business climate reforms milestone report 2020-21. I submit the report in recognition that micro, small, and medium enterprises remain the lifeblood of our economy. And as I stated earlier, my administration has instituted various reforms over the last years that tore down the barriers that constrained the growth of micro, small, and medium enterprises, enabling these enterprises to seize more opportunities and build back better. In that regard, I commit the reports of the record uh, to, to the record of Parliament so as to maintain the momentum of the powerful engine that has kept our economy roaring. I thank you all and may God bless you and may God bless, preserve and protect the Republic of Kenya and her people. And now, therefore, I hand over the reports to the Speaker of the Senate and the Speaker of the National Assembly in that order. Asante Nisan. Uh, Okay, order senator, order, order members. Honorable senators, having concluded the only business on today's order paper, the Senate now stands adjourned until tomorrow, Wednesday 1st, December 2021, at 9.30 a.m. in the Senate chamber. I thank you. Honorable members of uh, the National Assembly, the National Assembly now stands adjourned until Wednesday, 1st of December, 2021, at 9.30 a.m. All honor members and invited guests will join His Excellency the President for our reception at the Parliament Courtyard.
is in front. In the meantime, honorable members, please remain standing in your places as His Excellency the President and the Speaker's procession leave the chamber. I thank you. You have, you have been watching a special sitting of Parliament of Kenya, joint sitting of the Senate and the National Assembly, where President Uhuru Kenyatta